Right, welcome back to the Dymat channel. Or if you're new to me, thank you very much for clicking on this video. I'm Chris Bilton. I was a professional jeweler in the UK for over 20 years, but now I'm living in Japan and I'm making jewelry making instructional videos just to kind of document all the stuff I've learned over the years because uh, I think it could be helpful and useful to other people looking to learn to make jewelry. So welcome. Uh, right, this is overdue. It means to do this for a long time. I don't know why I haven't done it yet. Cause it's not a big job and I think it's going to be useful for people. But we're going to make an earring like a diamond stud. I'm actually making it with a moissanite stone today. Just a simple four claw stud. Diamond stud. I, I call it a diamond stud. It's a four claw setting just for one round stone. New addition to the channel, a whiteboard. This is uh, going to help me uh, explain things because it's difficult getting the camera at an angle where I can draw things nicely and show you clearly on the screen so I think this is going to improve it. Let's try it out today. Um, yeah just one thing to mention, earrings yeah, say that's like someone's earlobe you can't have a, an earring like really really deep like claw, there's the stone in there. Uh, that's no good because uh, the weight of it's going to pull it down is likely going to sag that way so you want to keep things as shallow as possible so, say that's someone's earlobe, like the stone really should sit really close to the ear. So it's as flat as possible. So a larger stone, obviously they're going to stick out more because the more, more this distance you got, inevitably means you got more this distance. So, so say this is our our stone. I think it's ideal if that stone has to be cut into the metal slightly. So you just got that there. That way you know you've got the stone going as low as possible, but there's still a bit of thickness there and then that's uh, definitely a strong collet then. These are our claws, I might as well call that bit there. And then the next, which is a good feature, is just being nice and open. I mean, quite a big gap there, if possible, um, without these being too thin, obviously. And then and your post will be coming off there. And the way we're making the actual collet is same old, same old on my channel. Get a flat bit of metal, turn it up into a rainbow shape. Then we're rolling it up round, so it's going to be a little cone shape. Get it the right size for the stone, cutting it through nicely, get a nice join. Then we're starting the daylight hole one side, putting two claws on, then doing the daylight hole from the other side, put those last two claws on, get it all correct dimensions. And uh, yeah, and then that's pretty much the whole job. And it's just putting the bar in the back and then putting the post on. Here is my moissanite. And check this out. I get loads of hate on my, I did a video, uh, I put a link on the screen, but I did a video called uh, Professional Jeweler's First Reaction to Moissanite. And, uh, I wasn't that impressed with it because I, I know what good quality diamonds look like and I think a lot of the people commenting on that video call me an idiot saying I'm threatened by moissanites and stuff taking over the industry. Uh, I forgive them because they clearly don't know what a nice quality diamond looks like. They only know what their moissanite looks like. So yeah, when you've actually worked with these this level triple excellent VVS1 D color diamonds, which I have, um, they're far superior to moissanite. And just to give you an example, yeah, this is meant to be, this is a certificate for moissanite, and I don't think a certificate means anything to do with the stone. Uh, they're colour grade D, so this moissanite is the best colour possible, yeah? The most colourless possible stone. Here's a CZ. That's quite a nicely cut CZ. See that? How is that CZ whiter than that moissanite? That literally... I don't know if it's going to show up so much on the screen, but here with a naked eye, that CZ makes that moissanite look quite yellowy. There's no way that's a D colour. So um, I don't mean to complain too much about the stone. I do actually like moissanite, despite what people think, I think. Um, I do quite like it, and I think it's worth making jewellery for. And it's quite nice that there is a, a low-cost alternative to diamond, but uh, it's not as nice as diamond, <laughs> in my opinion. But it's just my opinion, so whatever. Uh, okay, anyway, I've got uh, this bit of square wire. I think I just about get get the collet out of this. It's 2.6 square. Um, I'm just going to squash it flat. I think I think that's enough depth for the side of the stone. And I, and I kind of figure that out. I'll just put it next to it and like 
yeah, that's going to work. Like just, I think if I just go flat, it will obviously flatten it, make it longer, but it will just increase the width a little bit. So I'm going to anneal that and then mill it. When I'm milling little bits of square wire, I hold them in my parallel pliers. I mentioned this for actually making square wire. You can turn round wires square by holding it in parallel pliers and then guiding it, just squeezing it gently and letting the mills pull it out of your pliers. And obviously you turn it 90 degrees and do it again, but I'm not doing that because I just want it flat one way. So I tighten up a little bit, keep going. Make sure it goes through straight. Pull it out straight as well. When you're pulling, say that's coming out the rollers there, be careful not to do that as you pull it out because you can start to turn metal and then obviously that bit that's turned goes a little bit wider than the rest of it and you're making it, you're milling it uneven. So pull it out straight. So milling mine out, milled it out quite a lot. I mean, that looks still a little bit overly heavy to me. 0 0.85, 0 0.8, probably a good guide for thickness of it. I mean, the stone weighs nothing and ideally you want the earring as light as possible, but without, uh, without losing strength. Strength is still important, so it's the diamond is secure, but the thing itself doesn't have to be overly heavy. Uh, a heavy earring is not comfortable for people to wear, so keep things light where possible. When you are annealing, get your flame going along the piece, Just getting the full potential of the flame, so you'll anneal it quicker, won't be wasting gas, so you're not wasting money, not wasting time. Good way to work. You, you can do it like that way, but the heat's just blowing across in just one spot. The whole thing heats up much quicker like this. Sorry, I've got to show you again. I can't get over the colour difference. Look how yellow he is. So regular viewers to the channel will have seen this millions of times. Half round pliers. I've got a little groove cut in there, both sides. Hold that, the rounded side is towards me, securely in my peg. Where are my half round, where are my parallel pliers? Parallel pliers, that's a levering point, that corner. And then there is a levering point. So there, and I'm pushing it up like that. So it's no, I mean, I'm squeezing that quite tight, but it is prone. That's why I put the grooves in the pliers. Sometimes it is prone to just snap in that way and uh, it can twist your metal, you have to squash it flat again. Not ideal when that happens, but it does happen, even though it's one of those things, I know it might happen, and then you proceed carefully, but it still happens. So, definitely gonna happen to you when you start doing this. Uh, my advice is just work gently and only use the strength you need, don't go too hard too soon. Um, also, I recommend just moving it along the same amount and then tweaking it up the same amount. And then you should end up with a kind of neat curve also, I recommend before you get to the end, turn it round and then go from the other end as well. Uh, this is easier with a long bit of metal, but when you're working with gold and platinum, you need to be a bit considerate for the amount of metal you're using. Uh, especially if you're sharing a workshop with other jewellers and you've all got to go to the same little box for your bits of metal for your jobs. If one person just gets a chunk of metal and just mills it all out for themselves for their job, uh, that's no good because the next person might need like a, a little chunky bit for sizing a, a ring up or doing a half shank repair and all there is now is a long flat bit of metal. That's quite annoying. So cut off what you need and just mill that out. So when I turn mine up to a nice curve, just give it a tap, get it nice and flat. Might be a nice idea to anneal it again. Now sometimes you can, like I was just about to do this, I thought I'd show it, because sometimes when you're doing quite a small piece, quite a tight curve, if it fits on your ring stick, you can slide it up, see where it, have a look at the curvature. And sometimes you can get away with just tapping it down. And it helps you out a little bit. If you haven't done this before, you might be asking yourself, well, how, how do I know how much of a curve to put on that? And um, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, my collet punch is quite a steep angle, if you're interested, mine's 28 degrees. It's quite steep, so when I bang collets out, they're really tight angles on that, which I don't like. Sometimes it looks good, but sometimes I just wish it wasn't such an angle. So I need, basically I need a quite a tight curve for my collets to go in there and then not need too much hammering to get out to a nice, perfect shape in there. I'm just gonna give mine one last 
Shaquille O'Neal before I roll it up. Okay, so have a look at your metal. There's always a bit that's better than other bits. Like if I'm looking at that, get some light on it. The ends are always a bit straight, so that's straight to there, look. That looks like a bit of a flat spot there to there. But from there, this cut, I mean, that needs tightening up a little bit. Maybe, maybe from there to there is quite nice. Not perfect, but it'll do. That's about the kind of size of the bit of metal I'm gonna use. And then after that, it goes really straight again, so. Yeah, have a look at your, your bit of metal. There's always a, a bit you prefer over other bits. All right, forgive me if you heard this before, but I've always got to think about people who are new to this. So I've mentioned this on my channel on my few videos before, but I imagine that as a continuous circle, that curve. And when I cut this down, it's quite important to get quite a good angle on it because you could cut it like that or like that. It's no, no good. You need, you need to go at the right angle. So imagine that is a, a full circle and then you're cutting down to the center. So that's a circle, there's a center of the circle, you go straight up to it. Also another way of doing it is imagine like a T, like a capital letter T from the spot on the top edge. So that's perfectly horizontal, that's perfectly vertical up to it. So you're cutting down that vertical line. So this is not too important to get that angle perfect because we're gonna be, after it's rolled up, it's gonna be uh, cut through again anyway to get the joint nice and tight, but it's nice to get it kind of good. I think it's a good habit to always practice getting angles and stuff really good. Saves you work at the next stage. If you cut it wrong, then you've got more work to do, filing it up straight and stuff, so it's a faster way to work as well. So for this, I would use these pliers, like a half round, half flat, and half of them are like a round snipe. Hold it close to the end, roll it up. Again, I put a gentle curve in it uh, for the entire distance I would need to roll it up, and then probably won't anneal it, this piece of metal, but sometimes anneal it again and then tighten it all up. Now what I've started doing recently, well, let's have a look at the stone first. Have a look at the stone, make sure you have it in mind, kind of curvature you need. Not that far off, actually. So I'm checking my stone again. This is a bit of blue tack. Blue tack, if you don't have it in your country, because I don't have it in Japan, I don't know about it here. Uh, I need to buy some more and I can't get it. Um, but blue tack is basically just a sticky kind of, I don't know, it's not a gel. It's like a plaster scene, but it's used for sticking bits of paper to the wall and stuff, but it just doesn't leave marks or anything, it's quite good stuff, it's quite useful. So I'm using it for picking up stone, and I like it, so it gets my fingers out of the way, so I can hold a stone over the top of things and then just check the curvature. And I want the stone to be sat on top of this collet without seeing anything around the outside, that's quite important. If you can see metal around the outside of the stone, the collet is the wrong size. One thing I like about making jewellery is there's not really rules, like it's just whatever works well is fine. Like, so to hold this, you can hold it in your fingers, if you're comfortable doing that, it's quite good. Hold it in your parallels, whatever. If that, if that suits you better, do that. Got some pliers with like a bit of teeth on. Doesn't matter if you're cutting off a bit, it's not gonna be used. Uh, less likely to sort of move about, do that when you're cutting on it, putting pressure on it. So you can hold it with those pliers and do that. So you just, with experience, find what works for you. And in my apprenticeship, I, I had people telling me I can't put my finger on the file when I'm filing like that. Um, over the years, I've far surpassed anything they could do, and I think that's a really good idea. So they were wrong about that, and they were stopping me doing it just because they didn't do it. So I have that in mind, so I'm careful to guide people in making ways, making jewellery in ways that works and takes you straight to a good result, but at the same time, I'm not too strict on exactly how you do it. I get my blue sack again. Now I've closed that up. I can put that on and I can see it needs to come down a little bit, but then that join is complete junk. I need to cut through that and get that nicely closed up. But it just comes with experience of knowing how much metal to leave, how much of a gap you can see and then close it up. But you try it a few times, you, you'll have a quite a good idea of what needs to be done. Yeah, so I can understand now what needs to be done. Still a bit big. So I think once that's, even if I cut that join really reduce, cut through the join so it reduces it a little bit, still gonna be a bit big once it's tapped round. So I'm gonna cut a little section out, just a slither. And then once the join's tidy up, 
and I tap it into that collet punch, it's going to be about the right size. But yeah, basically I want it perfectly round, but when the stone's on top, I can't see any of the metal around the stone. I think it's quite good to show you me actually working rather than just and then solder this and then edit to it soldered up because it leaves lots of questions like well how much flux did you use how much solder did you use i'm always trying to keep beginners in mind or people who haven't done it before and just so that's a cut little section out i'm just going to squeeze it closed my fingers and cut through that joint again quite painful doing that you might want to spend more time closing it up nicely if it hurts too much Okay, let's check the size. I've made it even less round doing that. If I put the stone on, have a look down. Yeah, it's borderline around the edge. Okay, I'll cut for the joint one more time. So this is where people who work fast are basically just doing things accurately all the time. Like they would bend it up the metal they need, cut it off at the right length, turn it up quickly, uh, cut it off so it's the right size, uh, just moving forward, everything they do, moving forward. That's how you work quickly. It's not necessarily sawing really fast and then doing your filing really quickly. It's just making the right moves. That comes with experience. So you end up working quicker just with experience. You never actually feel like you're trying to work fast. Just being efficient and accurate. I'm not the fastest, but I've worked with people before. It's like you didn't actually see them working all day. And then at the end of the day, they've got like a whole ring finished. It's like, when did you do that? <laughs> Okay, so just cutting through it takes a tiny amount of metal out, but that's helped me. I think that might be all right. Once I tap round, and then obviously you need to, you still need to file the outside of the metal a little bit and then paper it up. So you lose a little bit of dimensions around the outside as well. So I think this is about right now. And the join is nice and tight. Get your join really, really tight is important. As for soldering, I'm just gonna plonk it on my charcoal blocks. Sometimes I like to hold things in tweezers, but silver, it's as you get it hot, it just turns to like butter and just things squash out of shape. So it's a bit of a liability. So for this, I'm just gonna just call it sat there. It'll be all right. A little bit of solder. This solder looks really dirty, so I hope it works all right. But our top, flame a Rooney. Nice soft flame is quite nice. Heats it up a bit more evenly and slowly. I do think I've improved in working in silver over the last year or so. Look at that. Lovely. Mmm, delicious. Hi, Janet. Look at that lovely solder joint. Just flood it down and then I always look inside to make sure it's pulled through. If it hasn't, you have to heat it from the back because the solder always flows towards the heat. I'll just show you exactly how I work on this just because it might be interesting. First of all, I, I look at it. Is there a bit of a lump on a solder joint? Yes, there is. So hold it in whatever pliers. Just get rid of that lump. There you go, gone. Next, before I bang it in the collet punch, can I round it off a little bit with my pliers? Don't have to do this, but it's nice to put it in the punch, a bit more of a round shape. Uh, it's probably worth looking inside before you put a punch inside, because if there's a lump, lumpy kind of solder join down the inside, um, that's not going to fit in there very nicely and it won't push out very nicely at all. It'll push out more around the rest of it, but not that bit where there's a lump. So if there is a lump, mine's all right, but if there is a lump, get a ball phrase and just zing it out inside. So mine's slightly more round, no lumps inside or outside. I'm ready to put it in the collet punch. So now I've got to find the best hole to put that in. That one or that one. These are too big. I'm going to have to, I can't hammer it down anymore. And so I can only put that into it and that's just going to hammer it out wider. This is quite a good size for the stone. So I don't want to change it too much. There is a chance after tapping it around, I'm going to have to adjust it again, but try and keep it as similar size as possible. That was too small because uh, it will just, it will just never go down in that hole. So it has to be this one. Now I don't want to push it out if possible. So I'd rather hammer that down. So let's just do that. My wife's downstairs, she hates it when I do this. But what the hell. I hate her too. 
I'm joking. All right, so now that's down as far as it can go. Now I'm gonna have to put the punch in. And uh, if your curve matches the curve of that quite nicely, there's less risk of you splitting down a solder join. So I'm actually, I'm actually nervous of hitting the end on the end of this. I think it just damages your hammer. So I actually do a lot of work on the side of my hammer. Okay, I think we got it. Sometimes you've got to really belt it to get it out enough. I've got to worry about mixing the moistener up with the CZ. The moistenite is the yellow one. <laughs> Put on my blue tack. Let's put it on top. There's a chance it's going to stretch out too big. It's not the end of the world. It happens to everyone. Uh, you're going to have to. Yeah, mine is. It's a bit too big. I can see it on the outside. Uh, so I just got to cut a section out and then tap it around again. Get it right. I would always make things correct to the stone because it's a bit of a gamble making it too small and then just assuming one of these will be correct to punch it out because different stones are different sizes and uh, you could get unlucky and then the one it fits in is too small so you can't really punch it out without putting a big horrible line around the middle as it catches on that edge. The other one's too big so there's no no chance to actually push it out anymore. So always make things correct to the stone and then after you've tapped it perfectly round and it's a bit big cut it down a little bit. That's, that's the safest way to work. So find your, like like me, I've got to cut this down a little bit now, but just cut out the solder join, obviously. Cut a little piece out, turn it up, and then keep checking the stone on. Now it's perfectly round, it's going to be really close, so get it right now. It's not that much work, it's like, puts you back like five minutes, not hardly anything. Okay, next day, can't remember what I was saying last time I was filming, but basically I've got this now, just pulled out the acid. Now that's too wide, I just milled out that square bit of wire I had, and uh, just kept milling it straight. And it ended up with what I ended up with, which is not a sensible way to make jewellery, but is what I did with this. Um, it's a bit too... Uh, I need to reduce the top a little bit, and it's too deep. I don't need it anywhere near that deep. I want to keep it as shallow as possible. So like I was saying at the start, shallower the better, really, without neglecting its uh, strength as a finished piece. This is 3.32, just as a quick guess. Like 2.3, 2.4 would be plenty, it would be a nice sort of finishing measurement. So as the top is a little bit big, like it's just hidden behind the girdle, I want it to sit down a bit like that, a bit lower than that. So I'm gonna just file that down. And obviously, because it's cone shape, the lower the top goes, it reduces the diameter of the top as well. So uh, it will be more hidden under the stone. So that kills two birds with one stone for me. It reduces the depth, which I want, and also reduces the diameter. And uh, I will do that. As soon as I finish this ice cream, which I've been hiding from my children since yesterday, and finally they've gone out with their mum, so I'm gonna enjoy this. Give me a sec. Ah. Oishi. Okay, so just get a file. <coughs> and see if I can hold on to it. You can be careful doing this. I'm literally just, I can't really squeeze it in my fingers. Uh, the file can be prone to just pulling out of your fingers. Uh, so just do your best. If you're really struggling to hold on to it while you file, I guess you could use those. I don't really like doing it because I'm worried about putting dents and stuff on the collet, but if you've got to do it, you've got to do it. Just, I would advise, just hold it as gently as possible to stop it moving and don't really crush it if you don't need to. So what I might do is, thinking about it, I might I'll put a little flat on top and may go around it. It's probably sensible. Um, yeah, go round it with my dividers, just draw a little line around the outside so I know exactly where to file down to. You can file off the bottom a little bit as well, just neaten that up. So I'm taking probably just over a mil. The line's probably a mil, I'll just, I'll just go over that line a little bit. So I like, a lot of jewellers I work with, they don't bother doing stuff like that because they've got the experience just to file it and know what's going on the whole time, but I quite like putting lines on things. I find just for the small amount of time to put a line on something enables me to work much quicker, much more confidently. So you just file down to the line. Because without that line, you may end up filing a bit wrong. It ruins your coney shape. 
Okay, mine was getting a bit hard to hold on to as it got shallower, so I'm just gonna hold it in my par in my uh, pliers. Well, these are nice, I guess. You can rotate it and look at your line as you file around it. Sometimes doing this, rather than trying to file across the whole flat of it, I, I tilt the blade on purpose, so I'm filing, as I'm showing on camera what I'm doing. I'm exaggerating it, but I'm filing a bit of an angle and then going across it and flattening it. It's just a, a way that you can sort of work a bit more carefully, get it down to your line. Because if you're always going flat across, sometimes you can put an incorrect angle on it. I actually think a lot of jewellers, as a couple I, I've worked with over the years, a lot of it is ego when they refuse to hold things in pliers, uh, refuse to use dividers. It's like a real, like, I hold things in my fingers, I always do, like, my, my hands are my clamps, <laughs> like I used to say. I think it's just a bit kind of macho ego shining through. <laughs> I can't be bothered with it. Just do what works. A brutal burr around that top edge there. What I'm thinking now is not to bother with the daylight hole around the middle. It's gonna make it much easier to make. Because it's so shallow, I, uh, I almost think it's not worth putting it on there. Okay, so that's cool. That uh, takes it's easier to make, a lot less time as well, obviously, not mucking about with a daylight hole going across the middle. Uh, I'm talking about a slot here, so it looks like two pieces divided, so there's a gap in the middle between them. Not doing that. So I kind of like how that stone's sitting up, perhaps a little bit high. Uh, very easy to adjust lower, just by taking out the middle anyway, so I'll leave it as it is for now. Uh, but the bottom of the stone is still like there, like a third of the way up that collet, so I'm going to take the bottom of the collet up now, just to get it, get the stone sitting uh, in the correct, correctly, get, well, getting the collet correct for the stone. Still relatively early stage of making the collet, well, like halfway through, say, only got to put the claws on. But uh, this is where we are setting it. I'm thinking of the finished result, basically. So I'm thinking with the end in mind, uh, getting a stone sitting at the right height. I don't think I'm gonna be able to show you this very easily, but I'm looking at the point of the stone, the culé, the culet, the culet, whatever you, however you pronounce it. Uh, doesn't stick out the bottom, look. Let me hold the stone straight. Doesn't stick out the bottom. It's not way up in there as well, it's like just, it's just there. So I can just see it as I tilt it that way and that way. So I know when I put a bar across, that point is gonna have to be, I'm gonna have to drill into it or ball phrase into it a little bit for the stone to be able to sit right down. That's exactly what I want. So the stone is as low, as, low as possible, as close to the ear lobe as possible, uh, but still there'll be plenty of strength with the bar going across. And as for the bar going across, this back hole, I mean, there's a few burrs around there, but that back hole is really small, I want it. I want to open it right up, so I'm just going to do that with a ball phrase, just put a ball phrase in there and uh, get it closer to the edge. So I'll paper around the outside and make sure I know exactly where that edge is and then choose a ball phrase to open it up nicely. Which uh, is also a good idea when you're considering taking metal away to reduce the weight of the entire piece as well, so it's going to work nicely with the bar going across, giving it more space and also reduces the weight. Okay, not, not ball phrase, something something like this. Some sort of bud or flame phrase is probably a bit more of a clever thing to use. I just seem to go to my ball phrases, first of all, every time because I've just got more of them and they're all, a lot of them are new. Wow, well, I did nothing. So just opening it up is gonna look much nicer, much more like a piece of jewelry. You don't want a small hole at the back. It just looks too, closed up and also gives it the illusion of being overly chunky. Okay, I'm gonna stick this one in. It's a, perhaps a bit too big, but I think it's gonna be all right. Ouch. Be careful when you hold on to things with a sharp edge and then put in phrase in it, because if it grips and then spins, it slices open your fingertips. Uh, so there's a balance of squeezing hard enough to stop it spinning uh, Combined with uh, Sort of knowing how hard to push things in But it's risky biscuits. I think I'm pushing my luck a bit there has happened to me in the past. It's not fun for a jeweler to have your 
thumb or index finger split open, not a good, good injury to get, especially when you're employed and you're expected to continue working for the rest of the day. <laughs> there you go, that's quite nice. I'm just going to reduce all these file marks a little bit with something a bit smoother, if I can hold on to it. Which I cannot. So the stone, the dimensions of the stone, are your daddy. <laughs> when they speak, you got to listen and do what you're told. So I'm just double checking where the point is uh, finishing. It's just about right. I could actually bring the bottom up a touch more, just give it a quick file, but I'm going to leave it as it is. It's okay. So I'll quickly go around the outside with a mini paper whizzer. I'll put a card on the screen to uh, give you a link on how to make these. I actually think that bottom section is more important than the top because the top is going to have claws around it and a stone on top. No one's really going to see it. So if that inner edge is a bit wonky, even if the outer edge is a little bit wonky, very likely it's going to be hidden. But the back, people can obviously take it off and they're going to see it. So make sure it's nice and round. Just gently touching it with a round file. Make sure it all looks nice. And if for any reason that outside of your outer edge isn't very nice, you could probably get away with tapping it in there. It might not hit the edges very nicely. Maybe, maybe something like that might be better. Find one where it just fits. Because got the top of it is quite vertical, so... Hang on. <laughs> Couldn't find it. Um, yeah, it's going to have to be that one. Just give it a gentle tap in there, just to, not changing the shape of it, just sort of faking the edge perfectly round. Okay, do you know what I'm tempted to do? So something I mentioned on the channel before, I did do it once, and uh, last time I mentioned it, I said I didn't want to do it. This time, I do want to do it. <laughs> what I'm talking about is putting your collet back in one of these. Maybe that one might be better. Now nah, this one. Nice and flat. If you have one, don't use them that often, but when you need one, you need one. Square collet punch. I'm going to tap inside that. You should probably find your solder join and then tap it over your join because that's where a claw is going to go. It's nice to have your claw over the join of your collet. And that way after polishing, you haven't got to worry about a little solder line showing up. I mean, if you do a nice join anyway, it's unlikely, but just to work with minimum amount of risk. Goes in nice and flat. I can see my solder join just there. So I'm going to line up the corner of this with that join. Let me see it. Okay. I would recommend holding it vertically. Make sure your collet is horizontal. Make sure your punch is vertical. And... Try to find your hammer. Sorry about my hand in the way. Give it a bang. I can't hit hard on that, come on. Give me a line. Okay, right, yeah. Got some nice little lines there now. So see that? Little lines inside. So that's where my claws go. Obviously it's still, your marking is perfect now, but it still takes a lot of skill and care to actually get a claw directly over that. If, you've, if you have put claws around a round collet before, you may know that just the slightest wrong angle or wrong position, and it really shows. Because obviously you've got bigger space between two claws and then it's over this way, so you've got closer space to the other two. It can look a mess really easily. So you've got to work really carefully. But having these guides, these little marks perfect, really helps you out. So I just tell you everything that I'm doing to make this. Thin saw blade, really thin one. I think my thinnest is cut six, if I remember rightly, which is really thin. I don't think you ever really need to go thinner than a cut six saw blade. Holding it in parallel pliers. Um, obviously holding it this way, I can't see that little groove, so I'm going to carefully find the groove. don't even need my pliers for this. I'm going to carefully find the groove, put my saw blade over the top. 
lined up nicely with the bottom one and just carefully pushing my saw blade up so it's not even cutting into the metal just to put a little nick there that I can see on the top edge and then I'll use that as a guide to cut straight down so I'll do that on all four so now with parallel pliers hook it in your little groove on top start it off again by pushing up and then just go straight down There we go, just cut a little groove to start off, start off the claw. There you go, you can see my little marks inside and where I've cut around the outside. Uh, yeah, be careful, it's not as straightforward as you may think, like, oh, just a mark, just cut over that mark. You've got to be really careful to cut on top of that mark. Your saw blade can very easily go one side or the other of it. And obviously, be careful to cut straight down as well, not at a dodgy angle. Okay, if you're happy with what you've got, uh, you may want to take your three-sided tri-square needle file just sharpen up that line just open up a little bit just so because we're going to silly the phrase into it yeah for round wire to sit in so you may as well it's easy enough we'll put your thicker saw blade in just to open up that hole make it a bit more pronounced i'm choosing a bit of wire for my claws now this is just wire i've got it's one mil wire i believe yep and it looks a bit thick a bit heavy on here so i'm going to pull it down a little bit maybe 0.8 again you don't need loads of wire, but it's nice to pull down enough that if you are got to take a claw off for some reason, like it goes on at a wrong angle, it's nice to put a fresh one on because the one you took off has got like bits of solder on it and they never seem to go on as nice as a fresh one. So uh, yeah, it's nice to have at least like two claws worth spare, but at the same time, you should kind of aim to just have enough wire for doing four claws. It's come in useful quite a few times that I can think of having enough metal for another go at a fresh one. Okay, so this is, uh, pulled it down through the draw plates. It was 0 0.9 and uh, comparing it to the stone and the collet, I just thought it looked a little bit, like a tiny bit heavy. But then I thought, if that's a real diamond that we're making the mount for, it could be the difference of someone buying it or not. Like if the claw looked too thin, maybe someone would decide, nah, it's not, that stone's not safe, I can't buy it. Or, and if the claws are just slightly heavy looking, they might be more confident to uh, proceed and spend a ton of money on it. So uh, maybe slightly heavier claws is beneficial. So I'm just gonna put it straight gently. There you go, just straightened it and use that. So that was 0 0.9 pulled straight. So it may have reduced a little bit, but barely anything. Just out of interest, I thought I'd measure it after straightening it. 0 0.91, <laughs> it's gone thicker. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I will uh, get a phrase, same size as that, and phrase it out, phrase out our little grooves. What I would advise people to do, you can get away with not doing this, but I would advise people, people who are learning or just improving their skill, get a phrase, a burr, a cylinder burr, that is less diameter than the wire because if you phrase into it and it because it's spinning yeah it pulls one way if you move it around accidentally because it's thinner you've got a chance to pull it back without making too much of a mess if you go directly to the same size as the claw it's totally unforgiving for any mistakes so it's quite a good idea to start with a thinner one and then you're opening it right up in the correct position and then you might want to get a burr cylinder burr the correct one which i've got here and then just zip, just bang it straight over the top it's probably a safer way to work to get it accurate. To get comfortable, hold it nice and securely against the peg. Lay this up and down. Uh, don't, I, I would, I would spin it gently and then move down onto it. Because if you spin it while touching it, there's a chance it's just got grip and go <laughs> So I spin it off the piece and then just touch it down on there. Or if you are touching, just with very, very little weight, not actually pushing weight onto it. Now that I've got one opened up, not lot completely, but it's a decent groove in there now. I put the stone back in it. Make sure it's, you're holding it nice and straight. Put your claw in the groove. Now, how's it sitting on the stone? Mine's touching the stone, but the stone can't really be lowered anymore, so I've got to get it. We'll get the top of it a bit of a 
a bit of a straighter angle, so so the stone will have to be so the claw will have to be cut for the stone to set in. So it's an opportunity for me to use my uh, to practice using my whiteboard again. So this is our uh, stone. My collet is like it's like this, it's just below the stone. So I'm literally thinking of mine when I draw that. Um, my claw is just sitting exactly like that. It's touching the stone, but it's no good because I don't want the stone to go any lower because I've got my distance how I want it just there off the bottom of the stone. Uh, so I'm going to tilt the angle off. So that's the stone there. I've got to change the angle of my claw a little bit. So it's gone. It's gone. Bottom's the same. I'm just going to cut it more like that. So that's what I'm doing. When I phrase into it, I'm not phrasing straight anymore. I've just proven to myself that's not, not going to be good. You could. I could put the claw in more that way, but there's a limit to how far you can go. Because obviously the claw, you don't want it. You don't want that, that edge level with that. You want a nice little claw around the outside. So all I'm going to do is just phrase. My phrase, rather than going that angle, I'm going to go more that angle as I go in. So the claws are a bit more, a bit more straight. But what's nice with trying it straight a little bit first and then seeing how you need to adjust it i now have the the technique kind of un completely understood so all the rest of them i'll just go down straight the same amount and then just cut in the top a little bit and then that will kind of work on all four claws okay guys i'm going to leave it there that's it for part one as usual the full instructional guides in entirety are only available to patrons of the channel if you want to become a patron there's a link in the description if you follow that it takes you to the patreon website uh, you can read about all the benefits of becoming a patron and, and then you get access to all the instructional guides so it's not only this one you get access to all of them and it's not expensive either only five pounds a month or ten pounds a month ten pounds a month is all the benefits plus you get all exclusive content and people are, are like contacting me directly and i help people out with their with their personal um, jewelry making projects so I just offer my expertise to you more personally as well if you pay the full £10 a month which is still very cheap compared to paying other jewelers uh, online courses they're, they're charging hundreds and uh, yeah just £10 a month and like I say it's not only this instructional guide it's all of them so as I upload more full instructional guides that, that value just increases even more so so I think it's quite worthwhile so talking of uh, Patreon, I've got two new patrons over the last few days. There's Lisa Broughton and Christina Gutierrez. So uh, sorry if I mispronounce your names. I do try. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate that and uh, really helping me and encouraging me and just making it possible to continue this channel and keep it growing and keep it going. So I want to I wanna grow it to as, as big as possible. So essentially, we're just spreading the word of hand making jewellery because it's an art that's got, sort of been lost over the last few years, I think. So I'm trying to bring it back. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. I hope to see you in part two on Patreon. If not, you're very welcome just to subscribe and watch the videos as usual. I appreciate that as well, just as much. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Bye.